So could I also ask that everybody turns off their video except for the participants so that the Zoom will record um, the, the four participants. I'll turn off my video after the, the introduction as well. Thank you. What I'll do as well is I will spotlight. Uh, once we start, I'll spotlight all of the four participants as well. So they, they'll be at the, at the right. Um, okay. Great, thank you everyone. So yeah, I'd like to introduce our host for this evening, Jonathan Rousen. Jonathan will be familiar to many of you. He's appeared on the channel a few times, including recently in the fantastic conversation with John Viveki, agent in the arena. Jonathan is a chess grandmaster and philosopher and has recently uh, written or pulled together and written the introduction for a, a book on, it was gonna be called a Metamodernism re Reader. What did it end up being called, Jonathan? It's here. And it's called Dispatches from a Time Between Worlds, Crisis and Emergence in Metamodernity. And I'll, I'll explain why that title came to be in a few minutes. Awesome. So Jonathan, do you want to ask me? Um, yeah, David, what's going on? Like, what's, yeah, what are we doing here about talking about metamodernism and rebel wisdom? Like, tell me uh, what it means to you, because, you know, not, not necessarily in great depth, but just curious to hear you know, how did you first meet metamodernism? Your, your eyes meeting across a, across a bar or, you know, the term must have been heard in a conference or you heard someone using it, people were getting excited about it. But I'm curious to know how you came to it, whether, whether it was fondly or in a, in a sort of oppositional position and mm -hmm. how that led to tonight's event. Yeah, it's a good question. I'd say that I'm, I don't fully understand it and I feel, a certain level of ambivalence towards the concept. I get, I mean, it's it's clearly, it's a little bit like game B in a way. It seems like a placeholder for something that feels generally right, that we need some deeper resolution of the, of the postmodern turn. So something in that place sounds right. And I like the sound of, um, I like the descriptions that are attached to it, but I find it kind of slightly ungraspable and very academic um, and, and I, I, I struggle to, I have a sense of what it means and I see some art pieces that I would consider to be metamodern or at least seem to me to be sort of in that space playing with things in a sort of postmodern way but with a sense of sort of uh, not, not just in a kind of slightly playful or nihilistic way but pointing towards a resolution that I don't often hear people in the metamodern space talking about. So I, I, feel like, I feel like it's a valuable conversation. It feels a little bit academic and heady to me. And so I'm, I'm interested in where it meets the, the real world. And um, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm here as a viewer as much as anything to, to learn more about this, this, this thing. Okay, great. Well, thanks, David. And we're gonna do our best. Uh, if anyone else felt similarly to David there, and there are those out there who feel like, Really, metamodernism, do you need such a clunky term? I mean, meta's bad enough, modernism's bad enough, put them together. You seem to have this kind of gratuitously complex term, um, which is apparently gonna somehow save the world. And that seems wildly Im implausible at some level. Um, let me back up and say that tonight we're gonna be speaking um, mostly the four of us. Um, I'm Jonathan Rice and as, David mentioned I came into this conversation partly as being one of two editors along with Lehman Pascal of the book called Dispatches from a Time Between Worlds. But I'm delighted to be joined by three friends and colleagues of sorts um, in no particular order. Lena Rachel Anderson is a philosopher from Denmark. She is currently working principally on Nordic Bildung, but she has a very illustrious background as a philosopher, has written many books. Um, and principally among them in recent years, something called the Nordic Secret, um, which is uh, very much worth your time. She's also written about metamodernity as such, a little pamphlet where she gives her own take on what this term means and why it matters to her. Um, Greg Denver, I've come across in different 
uh, ways, but as a very close confidant and advisor, often through Twitter direct message, no less, but nonetheless extremely useful for someone who really understands well, I think, this sort of more academic cultural theoretical side of metamodernism. So he's there as my sense checker for when I'm like, am I pushing this term too far? Does this, does this stack up with what you know of what the other guys think and so forth? And he's been really uh, invaluable in that process. And then we have, um, last but certainly not least, Daniel Gortz, who is, I believe, coming in tonight as Daniel rather than Hansi. Um, but of course, an important part uh, of the Hansi Freinacht character that has written um, really kind of almost cult classic texts on giving metamodernism a kind of political edge, linking it to developmental theory in particular, but creating uh, visions for the uh, sort of political visions for the future uh, that wrestle with the times that we're in. Uh, initially, I called the Listing Society and latterly the Nordic Ideology. Um, and in the show notes, eventually I'll, I'll try and twist David's arm to add in links to all of the things I've just mentioned, um, including a side view essay of Greg's that I forgot to make reference to, which is simply called What is Metamodernism and Why Does It Matter? And that's what tonight's about. Now, I should say that each of us come to this question in somewhat different ways. We're not by any means a kind of team in any meaningful sense. We don't uh, necessarily view the term in the same way or use it in the same way. And it's not just the terminology. There's even ideological differences, philosophical differences. But nonetheless, much of that I'm guessing for the audience watching now, the Rebel Wisdom audience and the potential audience online um, is not as interesting as first of all, getting to grips with broadly speaking, what is this thing and why does it matter? And then we can get into the divergences of why I emphasize this and not that. So that's how I hope to do it. And that's why I'm gonna go first um, because I came to this uh, a little bit like David with some ambivalence. Uh, in fact, the title of this book, I can share in all candor, but the reason this is called Dispatches from a Time Between Worlds, and it has metamodernity sort of sprawled onto it. You can see that there. Um, and so some people call it metamodernity and it was gonna be called the metamodern reader. But what's quite interesting about the history of this term is that by the time that idea came to fruition about three years ago, give or take, and um, Hansi Freinach's influence on the term was so great that people, that it was almost synonymous. Metamodernism and Hansi Freinach was, they were almost coextensive. So to, to create a metamodern reader, look to many of the people we wanted to write for it to be a kind of tacit endorsement of Hanseism. Um, and that many people were reluctant to go with that. So then, you know, being the sort of diplomatic, um, try and keep everyone happy as far as possible kind of guy that I am, we, we looked around different ways of doing this. And we realized that insofar as I had a view of what metamodernism is at that point, it's that it seems to me to be the quintessential philosophy of a time between worlds, that we are in some sense witnessing the mm, eclipse, latter years, ending, inexorable demise of modernity broadly conceived. And we are sort of awaiting expectantly, creatively, um, prophetically perhaps, some kind of new world and that metamodernism is sort of grappling with that sort of simultaneous ending and beginning that we seem to be living through together. Um, and that's where the between worlds notion came from. It also th that particular turn of phrase came from Zach Stein, who was one of the authors in the book who had written a lot about metamodern metaphysics. Um, but the reason the title is Dispatches from a Time Between Worlds, Crisis and Emergence in Metamodernity was that we wanted to keep metamodern as an emphasis, as a sort of cohering notion for the whole book but we also wanted um, to, to already open it up to show this is not just about one person's thinking or even if he is an invented person living in the Swiss Alps. Nonetheless, it's, it's a broader notion that, that many other people have a stake in. And as I got into it, I began to write my own uh, preface for the book, which really, I spent maybe three months, give or take, um, doing the necessary reading to try and get my own feeling for it. And I'm just going to begin by actually reading out the, the introduction to the essay, which is freely available online. It's called um, Metamodernism and the Perception of Context. And you're welcome, you can find that just by Googling it by me. I'm gonna read just the first two paragraphs so you can land this in some way. Metamodernism is a feeling and all that constitutes the feeling and all that flows from it. When we consider the mystery of consciousness, 
and the human drama playing out on this charming anomaly of a planet, feelings are far from trivial. They have cosmological significance. The metamodern feeling co-arises through the perception of our context writ large. It is aesthetic in nature, epistemic in function, historical in character, and it serves to call into question the purpose of the world as we find it and the meaning of life as we know it. If, dear reader, you do not feel called upon to read further, to try to understand more fully what metamodernism means, I cannot blame you and even envy you a little. Life is short, there is work to do, and we cannot dance with every ism that gives us the eye. To paraphrase from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, some are born into metamodernity, some become metamodern, and some have metamodernism thrust upon them. I am mostly in the latter camp. I didn't seek out this, whatever it is, word, concept, ideology, pattern, movement, structure of feeling, structure of feeling, stage, state, sensibility, episteme, movement, idea, notion, yet somehow metamodernism found me. I have used the term periodically, I have been called a metamodernist, and I have editorial responsibility for the book, Dispatches from a Time Between Worlds, Crisis and Emergence in Metamodernity. As one of its many adoptive parents, I notice I feel responsible for metamodernism and help, hope to help it mature in some way. Okay, so that was the beginning and there's a whole other 12,000 words or so that follow that. Um, and I'm just gonna speak off the cuff about where I am today, uh, if, several months after writing that unstructured, what it means to me now. And I, I still really value it. I feel less bashful about calling myself a metamodernist than I used to, and I'll try and explain why. So my, my, it's, I use the term perception of context because I think that's the, one of the better um, catch-all terms for making sense of what metamodernism purports to do. It purports to help you perceive what's going on at scale. Right now, how do we perceive? We perceive cognitively, we perceive emotionally, but we also perceive in a situated context, um, which is the early to mid um, 21st century in an internet infused era in something that's in a new, arguably a new phase of geological time, which some call the Anthropocene, but might be more accurately called the Capitalocene. In other words, a world that's been uh, defined by the forces of modernity of which capitalism is preeminent. It's a world that is not by any means entirely secular, if any, that's often overstated in the West, um, but is one where religion is no longer taken for granted as something that people orient themselves towards in life. So to perceive the context of the moment is to perceive something about ecological degradation, um, sort of a kind of informational explosion happening online, the smartphone is the new Axis Monday, uh, an awareness of technology coming from not just from Silicon Valley, but from around the world, radically reshaping our idea of what it is to be human. And in all of that context, we're like, what am I to do as a mere individual to make sense of the world and act within it? And that's where metamodernism comes in as a kind of holding pattern that says, okay, I have sufficient complexity, no less and no more, to make sense of what's going on for you. And I need both of these terms to do it. First of all, we're still in a kind of modernity. It, some say it's over, but if it is over, it's dying very slowly. There's still a kind of modernism in our education system, in our economic system. And postmodernism is here too. And I think when Lena speaks later, she'll speak about what it means for these things to be around at the same time. We're not going through historical phases one to the other. So it's a mistake to think of metamodernism or metamodernity as somehow a culmination of several prior stages in which it's entirely a new thing. It's much better to see it as the kind of thing that makes sense of multiple forms of cultural understanding, multiple kinds, multiple kinds of sensibility, co-arising in one world. And that's why we can follow our Twitter streams or our Facebook streams and see these extraordinary things happening, which on the one hand can be pre-modern, you can watch like Islamic State cutting someone's head off, and you can see something much more modern. You can see people earnestly talking about the stock market um, and talking about you know, whether your child's gonna get ahead and get into a good school. And you can have someone speaking about trans rights and the debate thereof and um, identity politics of various kinds, and that would be classically postmodern. And then you have this 
different thing, which is something that says all of these things are still there. All of them are partially valid in some way. They all come from a sensibility that's still quintessentially human, still part of us. And so that's where the term becomes useful because it helps you, the meta in metamodernism is a way of looking inside modernism. It's a way of saying it still defines us, but this term gives us a reflexive relationship to it. And the meta there is quite humanistic. And the reason that matters is that people sometimes think that it goes something like pre-modern, modern, post-modern, post metamodern, as if it's some kind of sequential thing. No, that's not how I see it. I think it's much better to understand it as the meta is a choice. The meta is a disposition and a, a kind of commitment to be in a certain kind of relationship to the forces that shape you. So to give you a sort of some slightly further clarity on that, you look at the term metamodernism and you think, I know what metamodernism is. It's the philosophy of metamodernity. And what metamodernity is, it's the phase after post postmodernity. No, it's not the way to see it. The way to understand it is that metamodernity is the phase that is there alongside postmodernity, modernity, pre-modernity, pre even indigenous cultures as well. But the, what's going on to be a metamodernist is actually to be a particular kind, it's to establish a relationship, to make a commitment to the times that you're in, to recognize that we're in a time between worlds. That's what the meta means in this context, is to relate to, it's, to, it's a sort of self-referential quality of we are that. We are those creatures who are in the time between worlds. We are the ones who have to fathom what the hell is going on and how we can possibly survive as a species, never mind thrive. When we have this technology taking over the world, apparent ecological collapse, political systems breaking down, and yet we're, life's full of hope, radiant sunshine, great time with friends, younger generations doing extraordinary things, enormous acts of heroism and resistance all over the world. And in that context, we're called upon to make sense of how do we act. So the, the meta in metamodernism for me is a kind of chirological commitment. It's a way of saying, it's not that it's the time before or the time after, it's the time where the is a kind of injunctive, uh, the, it's a, it's a the, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moment to make the resolve that we have to make sense of what's going on. And to make sense, what makes metamodernism different, this is what brings in Daniel's work and to some extent Greg's, the interiority of our lives is quintessentially important. To make sense of what is happening, it's not enough to do systems analysis, not enough to look at the world at scale and see what's happening in the news. You have to look within, to some extent between, and arguably beyond. That's why the subtitle for my essay, Metamodernism and the Perception of Context, is the, um, the let me get this right, the cultural between the political after and the mystic beyond. So the cultural between, Greg will speak to with more authority in a moment, the political after, Daniel, the vision thereof, what do we do now? How do we make sense of what's next? The mystic beyond, um, there, there are many different sources for this, but it's a way of saying, if modernity is coming to an end, one of the things, that's, one of the things that modernity did arguably was it severed the connection between the good, the true, and the beautiful. It kind of broke them apart. So you have a kind of scientific truth severed from the kind of ethics and aesthetics of the, of the good and the beautiful. And what one of the things metamodernism has to do is to take the responsibility of bringing these things back together. To get, I was, there was a joke before we came on about what kind of truth we were talking about. And the truth that I would be looking for is one that contains goodness and beauty as a kind of integral part of it. Um, so, that's, that's the way to see it for me. It's like, we need to realize that metamodernism is called for because we need to wake up to being in a time between worlds. That's the kind of cultural in-between feeling. Um, and I know that Greg can parse that with more finesse. The between can mean many things there. But we also need the political vision. We need to know what the hell we're gonna do next. That's where Daniel's work is quite, quite important. And we need the broad spectrum of perspective that Leonard's work brings as well. And where I've reached now is that towards the end of the essay, I was getting to so what? The, the case for a metamodern metaphysics is quite strong. The case to actually try to uh, do the kind of speculative work of trying to figure out what reality is like. We're not gonna go back to pre-modern religion. 
but nor are we going to stay stuck in a kind of flatland postmodern context where the notion of the sacred struggles to be heard, where we don't quite know which ritual practices to be following, where we're not quite sure what the meaning of life is, where arguably there is a meaning crisis, as Raviki would put it. Um, and so I, that's what I see as the kind of frontiers for metamodernism now. It's something about keep on articulating what is this cultural moment we're in. That's the challenge. That's one of the first things metamodernism does. What is this moment? What does it mean to be in a time between worlds? What does it mean for modernism and postmodernism to both be part of the world and yet try to eclipse that or move beyond it? Politically, non-trivial. It's not just about the next election. Those who metamodernists tend to see the problem in, in, at scale and they see many converging threats and they realize that one guy winning election as opposed to the other is not going to cut it. You need to think much more deeply and systematically. And then the mystic beyond, I think we do have to question the entire meaning and purpose of life. That's also a metamodern endeavor. So for all of those reasons, I've become very comfortable being metamodern. I think it's all of those things. I think it can be some more than others. Some are truer to the canon. Some are a bit more speculative, but they're all part of the picture for me. And that's why I'm happy to be here. And I'll be um, moving to the background ever so slightly for the next, uh, six, well, 40 minutes or so. But I want to begin um, with Greg actually next. And the reason I want to go to Greg first is quite important just to set the scene for that. I'm imagining that those people attending the event and watching online will have come across metamodernism in one of five different ways, give or take. Um, the, the, the first will be the one that Greg speaks to, which is the kind of rich cultural understanding, metamodernism in cultural artifacts, including films um, and series. Another will be through Dan, Daniel and Hansi's books. Another will be through Lena and a more sort of historical contextualizing periodiz periodization of cultural forms. There's also a new book uh, by Jason Strom, which is a more sort of social theory, um, rich theoretical account of metamodernism as a kind of capacious, encompassing notion of different ways of doing theory, uh, which is, has quite a lot of philosophical acuity and is recommended. And finally, as a kind of umbrella term, to be a metamodern is, is, is this kind of philosophy of a time between worlds, loose catch-all term for people who are somehow rethinking the world fundamentally. Okay, all of those five are important, but there is something particularly important about Greg's offering because Metamodernism has its own intellectual dignity, its own academic quality. And I think you can't really get into what it means until you're grounded in that first. The question of whether you should end there is an open one, but I think it's important to begin there. So Greg, if you could go next, please. Yeah, um, thank you for setting the stage with that great introduction, Jonathan. And thank you, Jonathan and David for inviting me to this event. And Lena and Daniel, I look forward to our meeting of the minds. For me, the term metamodernism is a name for the aesthetic sensibility found in the arts, popular culture, and areas such as religion, politics, philosophy, marketing, slang, and humor that has emerged over the last 25 years or so, replacing metamodernism as the dominant structure of feeling, beginning perhaps in the more leading edges of culture, but making its way into the mainstream over time. In order to explain what this sensibility is actually like, I'll tell my own story of how I got interested in it. I'm an older Gen Xer, which means my high school, college, and early adult years were in the 80s and 90s, which might be considered the peak of the postmodern era, at least in the United States, my home. I did generally enjoy the fun of postmodern referentiality, ironic detachment, and surface surfing games. And on a deeper intellectual level, I appreciated the attention postmodernism brought to the importance of context, the blurriness of boundaries, the interconnected situatedness of things, and the perspectives of the marginalized. However, I also felt that this irony-soaked postmodern culture left not enough room for things like earnest self-expression, vulnerability, appreciation of beauty, and simple pride. I yearned for all of these things and yet did not want to come across as uncool, clueless, or cheesy. All of this mattered to me a lot as both a fan of the arts and being myself an artistically minded musician. So I wondered eagerly if there would ever be a post-postmodern movement 
what that would look like and what it would be called. Well, in the first decade of our new century, I started noticing it. Bands like the Ben Folds Five, Elliot Smith, Sufjan Stevens, Death Cab for Cutie, Rilo Kiley, novelists like Dave Eggers, Jonathan Franzen, Jennifer Egan, films by auteurs such as Miranda July, Wes Anderson, and Michelle Gondry, television shows like Six Feet Under, Community, and Bojack Horseman. These were all very different from each other and yet shared a certain vibe. They were clever and self-aware enough to pass the postmodern cool test, yet very much made room for the nuances and intricacies of human emotion. Now, I am not myself an academic, but my friend Linda Siriello, who is a religious studies scholar, discovered that scholars in the humanities, philosophy, and cultural studies had come up with a name for this sensibility, metamodernism. In a 2010 essay called Notes on Metamodernism published in the Journal of Aesthetics and Culture, Timotheus Vermeulen and Robin Van Deniker described metamodernism like this. Ontologically, metamodernism oscillates between the modern and the postmodern. It oscillates between a modern enthusiasm and a postmodern irony, between hope and melancholy, between naivete and knowingness, empathy and apathy, unity and plurality, totality and fragmentation, purity and ambiguity. Indeed, by oscillating to and fro or back and forth, the metamodern negotiates between the modern and the postmodern. One should be careful not to think of this oscillation as a balance, however, rather as a pendulum swinging between poles. So it's not a meeting in the middle, but it's a swinging with each one having its own you know, integrity and dignity. That's, that's my own little additional comment there. Um, back to their quote. Each time the metamodern enthusiasm swings towards fanaticism, gravity pulls it back towards irony. The moment its irony sways towards apathy, gravity pulls it back towards enthusiasm. In the essay, they gave examples of their metamodernism that lined right up with the trend Linda and I had noticed. And on a website that they founded with the same name as their essay, a whole bunch of other researchers also began documenting the trend. Meanwhile, the concept spread and was used in the writings of other authors published in various academic journals and spread further into the world where arts journalists and online video essayists used the concept of metamodernism to interpret music, film, television, et cetera. In 2013, Linda and I started our own website, whatismetamodern.com, where we have so far written about more than a hundred examples of metamodernism. Though I'm not an actual academic, I have had the opportunity to present about metamodernism at several academic conferences and with Linda as co-author, I've had a chapter published in a multi-author academic volume on the paranormal and popular culture. Linda and I, in collaboration with the UK-based AHRC Metamodernism Network, are cur currently organizing the first North American conference on metamodernism slated for September in Seattle. My own spin on metamodernism is this. Well, I think that the description of oscillation between modernist and postmodern qualities is apt. I don't feel like it does enough toward explaining what the motivation is for artists and their audiences to engage in this sensibility. I believe that each episteme that precedes metamodernism is characterized by its own particular relationship to knowing. And I believe metamodernism does as well. Tradition is about knowledge and ways of doing things that are passed down from elders and in canonical scripture. Modernism is about clearing the decks of accumulated arbitrary tradition and using human rationality and inventiveness to discover new, more true and more universalized forms of knowledge. The arts under modernism, roughly 1880 to 1950, reflect this. Postmodernism, roughly 1950 to the late 90s, turned modernism's critical eye back on itself and questions the very idea of objective independent universal truths. It emphasized the ways that things were connected more than the individual things themselves and sought to understand the context in which any claim to truth arose. Postmodern art forms often employ irony, intertextuality, and the mining of sources that fall outside highbrow aesthetics. Metamodernism arose around the turn of the millennium when artists and their audiences became dissatisfied with the way that postmodernism banished the self, the capacity for certainty and earnest emotion. 
However, metamodernism does not seek to turn the clock back to the time prior to postmodernism. Instead, metamodern cultural products generally find a way to satisfy the postmodern itch and re-embrace a modernist sense of conviction. So my formulation is metamodern cultural products serve to protect interior felt experience from the potential degradations of postmodern ironic relativism, modernist reductionism, and the ontological inertia of tradition. So why is this important? Why should people try to, why should people trying to understand the present moment care about metamodernism? Before answering that question, I should address a bigger one. Why are the arts in general important? And what is the value in making theories about the arts as we do when we theorize about metamodernism? Well, I may be biased because I am someone who is very oriented towards the arts, but to me, the arts are the most important tool we have as humans to understand ourselves, other people, the world, and our relationships with other people in the world. We use the arts and culture to build stories that help us see ourselves. And why do we take, why do we make theories about the arts and culture? Why not just enjoy the arts on their own without all this talking about them? Because the arts and culture need a story too, a story about the stories and how they all fit together. So when I talk about the modernist sensibility that prevailed in the first half of the 20th century, I'm telling a story that helps me understand the overall cultural unconscious of the people who historically influenced the world we have today. When I talk about postmodernism in the second half of the 20th century, I'm telling a story about history and the backdrop of an earlier part of my own life. And since the modernist and postmodernist tendencies continue today, as Jonathan very astutely mentioned, even as metamodernism emerges, it is useful to understand their impact on the present moment. Metamodernism, of course, is a story about the present day and helps me weave together a meta story about things going on currently in the arts and popular culture. So the role of the arts in help helping us understand our lives has been important through all historical periods, not just with metamodernism. However, metamodernism is particularly important right now as we grapple with so many factors that attack our sense of meaningfulness in life. First, there is the lasting legacy of postmodernism that cared more about context than it did about the actual things surrounded by that context. Then there is our present day hypermodern fractured internet reality with so many perspectives available that it leaves the self befuddled, searching for a stable place to stand. Then there is also the present day emphasis on understanding the self as a member of an identity group. There is value in people belonging to who belong to marginalized groups joining forces to have their needs known and met, but sometimes this comes at the expense of the individualist sense of identity. So metamodernism is a sensibility that you find in various culture, cultural products that honors these kind of postmodern confusions and ambiguities, um, but makes an effort to restore the dignity of the interior self in various ways. Even spiritual transcendence is yet one more factor that can have a side effect of undermining the self. Of course, some may say that is the whole point of spiritual transcendence, but in any case, metamodernism still wants to protect the interior and the personal. There is an amazing new film out in theaters called Everything Everywhere All at Once that many people I know urged me to go see, describing it as metamodern through and through. The film involves people attaining a consciousness that spans multiple, multiple alternate realities, but it doesn't stop there. What it's really about is how one can maintain the connection to the personal sense of self and family in the face of such spiritual transformation. And that is part of what makes this movie so metamodern. It also has a tone that oscillates between wacky and profound, deals in identity representation in a way that does not undermine the self and more. I'd strongly recommend you go see it. Speaking of recent examples of metamodern culture, a few other reference points. The singer Billie Eilish presents a persona that oscillates between postmodern norm-busting goth chick and sweet, wholesome girl next door while offering music that both reveres traditional forms and breaks them open. 
The television Ted Lasso is almost groundbreakingly earnest, but presented in a self-aware manner in which the show knows that its wholesome earnestness is understood by the audience to be novel, thus calling attention to itself in an ironic postmodern sense while delivering the wholesome goodness. Another fairly recent metamodern television show is Fleabag, which plays all kinds of postmodern-ish tricks with its form, but not simply for the postmodern priority of making audiences think about form, but also in order to gain access to deeper levels of its character's interiority. I think I'm hitting my um, time, so I will just leave it at that for now, but um, I will say self-promotionally, if you wanna see like how we treat a whole bunch of other examples of what we see as metamodernism, um, again, the, our website is what is metamodern dot com. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. It's very civilized of you to uh, finish on time and um, <laughs> grateful for that sharing. The um, I, I've given in the show notes a link to your essay and the side view, which I personally find really edifying on both your own take and to some extent how it relates to other takes on metamodernism. So uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to um, save Hansi for last, and I hear from Lena next. Um, Lena, I couldn't find my book. In, actually, I just found it. One second. Um, I just wanted to sh quickly show this. Yeah, yeah, because I um, just moved house, so I, I'd given up, but by chance it appeared. Um, so, you know, Lena is, has written the book, as it were, so every reason to trust her judgment on this. She actually has a chapter in this book, which we won't get into now I don't think but it's called but do you have a vegetable garden an alluring title um but for now Lena tell us what you think is going on what is metamodernism why does it matter uh what's your own view yeah so I am actually old enough to remember the time before postmodernism um, so I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, and I remember when two of my high school friends came home from Paris in 1984, and they had been to Café Coste in Paris that Philip Stark uh, designed. And they were like, and they had these chairs with bowling balls on them, uh, because that was the sort of irony put into furniture. And, um, and then we were, there was this whole new thing about irony, and I, I had kind of had this sort of self irony before that but suddenly there was a whole culture that emerged with with this um uh yeah these cross references of all kinds and then we had all the bad taste parties in the 1992 and then there was pulp fiction i think that was 94 and so there was this new movement and so that would be my generation and and uh, so when i was in my 20s we all you know distance ourselves from ourselves and everything and um at some point i sense that you can't live your life on this i mean th there needs to be depth there needs to be a foundation under things you need to have honesty you need to have a soul and and um and so actually in the, in the late 90s i began to start exploring this and i started writing about the future and i was uh, I wrote a book series in Danish called uh, Both And. I'll spare you uh, the Danish part of it, but it, it's uh, it's five books and they're this thick. And this is the Both And Friday, the last book. And what I actually wrote as the very last footnote in this monster of sincerity and irony is that I write here, irony is on the boundary or the border between meaning it and not meaning it. I'm writing on the boundary or the border of irony. So that was actually my first attempt at, at metamodernism before I actually knew the word, and that was back in 2009. Um, and so I've, I've been working in this field for, for a long time, and it's uh, uh, I ran into Daniel and Emil in Stockholm in around 2012-13, sort of, and Daniel was the one who found metamodernism on the internet and sent an email saying, what's this? And we found something or Daniel had found something that framed many of the discussions that we had that we had had um and as I started exploring this and, and that was the article in the, the manifesto by a uh, uh, van den Acker and for Marlin and um I I uh, wrote about it actually already in, in 2007 uh, 16 
before I wrote The Nordic Secret. And what I realized when I was working with metamodernism as a pendulum between the modern and the postmodern or a juxtaposition or a blending, I mean, it can take many forms. I realized that just having a, a, a culture, a civilization, an understanding of the world of just the modern and the postmodern is simply not deep enough. There's all the stuff that went before it. And, um, and not just the traditional meaning the renaissance and i mean uh, from gutenberg's invention of, of of the printing press and back to maybe the bronze age there's something even before that that was radically different than the pre-modern traditional traditional world which is the prehistoric indigenous and so i started working in four cultural codes and rather than um just oh the quoting signs from good old postmodernism, the just the uh, the modern and the postmodern, um, and just having it as, as a sentiment. Um, I was more interested in trying to find out how can we create a meaningful future? How can we get the best from the past with us into the future and not lose things that cut the roots, so to speak, from our existential yeah, meaning making emotional lives and what it means to be human and to make my my version of meta modernity so i talk about meta modernity and i i do it because i talk about a structure not a sentiment and i do it because i distinguish between talking about four cultural codes that we need to combine or bring together uh instead of just talking about two um but what i what i realized is that what we can take from the past and bring with us into the future which parts of the codes that we can bring with us depends on the group size of people if it's not going to turn into corruption so from the indigenous i mean we got 300,000 years of being stone age people in hunter gatherer tribes or in in early horticulture and but still very small communities that is where we can have the intimacy the connection to nature the spirituality the group sizes where you can read body language and have eye contact so you can spontaneously sense what is going on in the group and can we go this way or can we go in that direction do we all say yes to this idea do we say no and do we need to discuss it further before we make a decision uh, when you have two thousand people in a bronze age city town or a hundred thousand people in a, an iron age ring walled city uh, you have to have governance in a different kind of way. And when the most advanced communication technology you have is a little clay tablet and, and cuneiform or uh, litter pigeons or something like that, uh, or horses writing with scrolls of paper, um, you have to have a hierarchical system. Otherwise, you cannot keep peace and you know social peace within the community. You also need to have shared narratives. Uh, a shared imaginary, an imaginary uh, imagined community. And so religion turns out to be really useful and it gives people a sense of community, purpose, rituals that bring people together and, and shared moral norms. And so societies that managed to develop that survived. Societies that did not manage to develop that did not survive. Um, and then we have the modern world with societies uh, of, of millions of people, maybe hundreds of millions of people and here we have uh, radio, television, book, print, printing press. And so we can communicate with more people. And, um, and that is where we also developed the scientific process, democracy, human rights, equal rights. And so that goes well with hundreds of thousands, millions of people. But you, if you try to apply rule of law and democracy in a family of eight people, you would tear the social fabric and the emotions apart. And if you try to take the sort of the emotional leadership of the small group and apply it on a million strong uh, society uh, and have a family deciding everything, we call it corruption. So you can't transfer the power structures from, from between group sizes. That would be one of my main takeaways. And then you got postmodernism where we have all kinds of perspectives around the globe um and and that started in the 90s with the vcr and uh the disc man of, of, or the walkman and the copying of cassette tapes sounds like you know 
generations ago, but that's how old I am. So, um, so the, 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 the different perspectives were that we needed to develop a, a way of handling um, came in the 90s and, and early 2000s. And now we need to bring all of it together. And one of the reasons we do need to bring all of it together is that we, I don't think we'll survive our own inventions and our own good intentions if we try to tell everybody around the globe that we're going to take away your religion or uh, we're going to create a new uh, form of governance that is postmodern or or only modern we need to be able to, to tell people and to tell ourselves that everything that you know that is meaningful to you if it's religion you can keep that but you have to add something in this case modernity and the postmodern or if you're a modern person with the modern worldview taking that away from people is not going to work but you can say you can keep your modern science your uh, way of understanding the world from a modern perspective but you have to add something i mean you you need to connect with nature in a spiritual way like we did ten thousand years ago you also need to get them the postmodern deconstruction of everything and then on postmodernism, I think uh, what I see around me is that we have a, a generation of young people who grew up uh, during postmodernism and who unfortunately have grown up in societies that never gave them moral guidelines. And that is okay when you're 25 or older, but it's not great when you're six years old or seven years old. Uh, the child brain needs adults who take responsibility and who stand up for the way that the world is. So we need to integrate into our culture, if for no other sake, in order to be able to bring up children to be mentally healthy teenagers and young adults and adults. Uh, we need to stand up for something as adults and tell children that, oh, this is the way it is in our home, and now we do it like this, instead of always saying, so what do you feel like doing? Because three-year-olds are not ready for it, seven-year-olds are not ready for it, and it doesn't really work with 12-year-olds either. Um, doesn't work with a 45 year old boyfriend either but that's a different story so um so i mean we do need to bring these different layers together and, uh, and i think we can find wisdom and uh ways of communicating being together and organizing things better if we have all the layers so um that will be my take on meta modernity okay thanks a lot lena and daniel i've been very patient i'm just going to sum up very briefly that my sense is given the question was um partly why does it matter and, and David was also keen to get to that. My sense for hearing from Greg was it matters about protecting interiority. It's something to do with the kind of meaning that we need to uh, feel, um, but also create. It matters because um, that's what art does to some extent. It helps to make sense of the world through these creative ventures and that the metamodern is a particular way of doing that's called that's called for today in some sense and then lena there's a kind of different more structural analysis quite a useful distinction for those listening you feel a bit lost this sort of sentiment and structure or sensibility and structure is quite a useful way to think about it um they can both be relevant but you can emphasize one or the other and lena's emphasizing structural features vis-a-vis -vis institutions and technologies giving rise to cultural kind of epochs um, and arguing that the reason metamodernism or metamodernity matters um, is because our, our sort of curriculum today, our hidden curriculum, our challenge is to bring the best from the past, but to somehow lose the worst, um, but not to pretend that we could somehow wish away our Stone Age inheritance or our, or our modern, modernist impulses or our postmodern perspectives, that we have to somehow carry all of them with us in order to fashion a new world. And that's why metamodernism matters because it speaks to that. Now, with that said, Daniel, I can see, um, I know that you're you know, father of a young child and um, no doubt difficult to wait for so long to speak. So I'm very grateful. But now you are sort of Mr. Metamodernism for lots of people. Um, so tell me what is it and why does it matter? Ah, whoa, 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 one second. You're actually not connected anymore. Mute. Uh, let's see. Am yeah, I? You are, no, you're okay now. You're okay now. I just unmute. Yeah, you're fine so, now. Yeah. 
PS4, a lot of people, uh, I would be the met, uh, Mr. Metamodernism, but actually that's, I think that's sort of what it feels like for you and me in certain, uh, certain networks. If you look around in the world uh, or you Google metamodernism, uh, you get a lot more of the, uh, let's say, Dutch school, Vermilla Madanak or um, Greg Denver's work, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, I think uh, in terms of just sheer readership, uh, the Linus, Linus pamphlet is uh, probably outstripping uh, mine or our books uh, fairly well, given a lot of people read, read the, the shorter introduction, which overlaps a lot, uh, but it's not the same thing exactly. And same, I guess you could do a Venn diagram with uh, with all three, uh, or even all four. I mean, Jonathan Rosen's positions, <laughs> and um, I, I hear myself leaning in a lot, uh, or I feel myself leaning in a lot when you speak, Greg. Then I feel myself like, oh yeah, uh, I also think of, uh, like that, uh, Lena, and uh, well, yeah, obviously I ha have my own tapeworm version, and there are a few things worth. Um, mentioning as background to that. So uh, one thing is um, one thing is this term integralism. This is in a, in a way, I think the original idea for this rebel wisdom thing was, uh, was to, uh, to follow up to the state of integral. So people had discussed a little panel of four, I believe, had been discussing, uh, or panel three, had discussing the state of uh, integral theory, right? And, uh, and I was really interested in that for a number of years. Um, and um, there were certain things that that stuff brought to my life. Uh, one, one thing was, um, well, I was a sociologist or studied sociology and wanted to, to pursue a career in that field. Uh, or, or some, some, someone within the social sciences and, or, or at least the humanities. And the whole thing was about critique. And that, that was often literally said by the professors, like what, what we offer society is critique. So it seems sort of, and, and also I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, be part of some, some sort of meaningful political movement. Well, okay, things aren't good for the world in so many ways. And what can you do? Like, okay, I hang out at the anarchist cafe or, or but then I guess get this sense of hypocrisy uh, around it. Or uh, I, you know, would sit down with the libertarians and it's like, hmm, it's uh, pretty tunnel visioned. I, I couldn't commit to any of these things, right? Uh, so I wanted to do something positive, but I was too critically minded, you know, maybe by training uh, and maybe by, um, uh, or just skeptical by nature or personality. So I couldn't really commit to anything. So I, I, I you know, had this lack within me, uh, as, as I think both of you also mentioned. Uh, and, um, so that was from a social science perspective, but also I suppose from an existential perspective that while I had this lack, I really wanted to work to change stuff. I, in many ways, even though I had had a good upbringing, um, yeah, I was, wasn't entirely happy in, during my, my young years and, and had, had anxieties and so forth. So, well, you know, and if you think about that as a, as a sociologist or social psychologist, you, um, well, obviously you start thinking about, well, there, there, there are structural, structural things going on. There, there are things about society that could be different that, and life could feel different. So in comes around age 25, uh, this, this stuff, integral theory and, uh, it does several things for me that puts together a lot of like it has it it, it works with these meta maps uh, where where you put together different ways of viewing the world. Um, some of the ways are a little bit clunky, but they're so much better than not having the maps. That was my experience. Uh, they bring in within these maps. They also relate. Well, the interiors are interior experience. Uh, they are another side of everything that we experience as, as objects out there in the world. You can't really have one without the other. So it's okay to explore 
I, uh, it's, it's okay to explore things that aren't necessarily things. It's, ex it's okay to explore, you know, just being, just your awareness, just how things arise within you, your inner depths. Um, it's okay to cultivate introspection or you'll never bust your own bullshit. That's not gonna happen as to as, as the cognitive scientists um, tell us again and again, but, but at least there is something like coming to terms with that. There is at least, um, well, I, I guess it opened up, it, it gave me, it gave a legitimacy to the inner dimension, right? And uh, through plunging into that, a lot of the anxieties that had been in my life sort of cleared up. It's really, and at the same time, I had these maps for putting together all, all this social science, et cetera. Uh, and there was also this idea of development, right? Uh, development from developmental psychology that made its way into integral theory. That, uh, there's there's a direction, even if it's not necessary. Well, for integral theorists, it's often a teleological direction. You believe that God is like manifesting in new, new uh, ways or forms. I'm not sure I ever felt that way, but um, but at least that aha in, in theories such as Piaget, for instance, if give, given the right circumstances, um, it, it is likely that uh, th that a person can mature in recognizable uh, in recognizable manners, and um, and that that sort of gives hope kind of gives an inner compass you can ask yourself like okay so what's the problem right now and instead of like where's the evil how do we destroy it how do we remove it right there's the sense of like how do we help gently cultivate scaffold etc something the next thing to emerge that would redefine the situation so that the, the, the thing that seemed insoluble or an awful conflict uh, or, or anxiety provoking or something else would, would feel different, right? And it's, I suppose um, we had a few rounds uh, negotiating the terms even for this call, right? And, uh, and in, in situations like that, it's oftentimes about redefining redefining what the whole thing is about, you know, finding new angles, and, and voila, there is actually where there seem to be a conflict there or, or conflicting interests or lack of mutual trust or something, you actually have something extra valuable on top of the case, right? Hmm. Um, and the, the more I actually, the more troublesome the other, the deeper the insight about myself that they'll have, it's all of those things, right? So, so I mean, so those those ingredients showed up, right? Like, aha, uh -huh, you can you can map different perspectives if you understand the property spaces within which you 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 understand the world. You you can uh, you you can actually it's okay to cult cultivate the spiritual sides of life, including the aesthetic. Um, and or existential or philosophical and or even religious if you, if you want and it's and there might be some what however hopeless whatever claustrophobic or uh, you happen to be in at the moment there usually is some sort of there usually is some sort of higher solution even even if you can't see it right now right so uh, and, and, that, and then that there's some kind of directionality and that those directionalities are, are, are recognizable. So I got really interested in using this integral perspective self. However, I also got very disappointed with it because it, uh, I, yeah, I, you, you've been pointing this out, Leanna, like the, the integral perspective oftentimes bakes in too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, basically, one way or another, back to the Vedic roots of, of Eastern religion, and and, the, and it it sort of never shakes off that heritage, 
And that uh, that leads to a lot of magical thinking sneaking in here and there. There was even a cult uh, among, uh, or actually now two cults that, that came out of the integral movement. Um, and the second cult was smaller, but yet more awful than the first one and it's still ongoing. Um, and um, and also, you know, I just I just thought as a framework wasn't I noticed when I tried to organize politics and stuff, a political party in Sweden around it, I noticed it wasn't so good at its social theory. Uh, and you know, it was kitschy also, just like you always have these Alex Gray paintings, and uh, they were all from from some kind of um, psychedelic trip or something, or 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 a hot, very very high cosmic experience. And I mean, I you can have experiences. There are people who have experiences that correspond to those to to to, to the uh, you know sheer colorfulness, energy, and vibrancy of such images, but they're inappropriate in most contexts and for most people. Um, and they will look hysterical and kitschy, and that will repel people. And uh, more and more people are repelled, except the folk folks who are attracted to that stuff, uh, who then become more and more magical in their thinking and their cult-like, or, or what I call the astrology precariat-like um, uh, tendencies that show up. So metamodernism shows up as another term for it, because integralism wanted to be an answer to, to post-modernity, post-modernity, which I had experienced within the frames of social science. Uh, so metamodernism uh, was kind of, well, it, uh, Thomas Steininger once said, this uh, uh, German professor, he said, uh, aha, so metamodernism is, uh, is a design intervention in a sense in, in, in integralism. Well, yeah, uh, it's, I wanted to bring that term in and marry to the good stuff from, from, from um, uh, integral theory uh, so as to make integral theory safe for democracy, so to speak, <laughs> because it wasn't safe for democracy. It, it, explodes, it, it exploded into totalitarian bullshit again and again. <laughs> that's, that's sort of where, where I found it and where I wanted to use it. Um, and it has th those things, right? Irony, sincerity. But when you like, when you're getting too kitsch, you make a joke about it. Whoop, back again. But like, okay, where is it? So, so, so yeah, I, I, and I don't actually disagree with you, Nanda, when you say that could be metamodernism. That could be metamodernism is an integration of modern progress and hope and. Uh, or oscillation between. Um, right. Daniel, just what, just one second. Just I hope it might help rather than interrupt you, but just the, the, just because I'm thinking of as you were speaking that I remember coming across this view to try and make sense of Hanzi that it was necessary to the relationship to integral, which I think will be familiar to most rebel wisdom viewers. So we don't need to lay it out, but it principally through the work of Ken Wilber, many books, many developmental models often with quite a strong spiritual theme, uh, often giving rise to a sort of four quadrant map of reality. So the, 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 the integral world was, was seen as a sort of toolkit to get beyond uh, postmodernism. And you were saying that uh, it didn't quite work for you for various reasons, it, partly for the reasons you've laid out. But I wanted to just read this bit to you because um, the way I put it here is to make sense of your work, to put it straightforwardly, the subtext of Hansi's books is that he is saying integral theory has failed and metamodernism is now called for. In that quest, Hansi attempts to use the sensibility of cultural metamodernism that he has kidnapped to usurp integral theory and to subsume it within political metamodernism. And that's the sort of, sort of you're using the sort of cultural code from the metamodernism that Greg sort of described to create something that goes beyond integral theory, but somehow it transcends and includes it in some way and makes it more political and more, more developed, well, more sort of injunctive, more like let's do this, not just describing the world, but actually more like a programmatic. Is that how you'd see it? Have I got that right? Yeah, there were a couple loaded words there to be fair, but, uh, but sure. Um, well, kidnap, by the way, was 
you know, yeah. Shanghai was the word you used, which yeah, I, is a... I also use that. True, true. Um, uh, and um, as, as that, that's sort of where, well, I, I was, I suppose I was closing up, but saying that, that that's where a more political metamodernism uh, uh, came from. Um, and um, the, then the, the metamodern sentiment seemed to have what, um, what integralism lacked. Oh, oh, and yes, this is where I was going. I don't necessarily disagree with you uh, Lena, when you say metamodernism is the integration of these two things, modernity, postmodernity, or postmodernism and postmodernism, because ism then is, of course, a striving towards or, or, um, or um, well, something that is ish, ish as something that looks like something or tries to become something some, like something, metamodernism. Um, looks like metamodern, smells like metamodern, or wants to go towards metamodern. Where metamodernity would be something more established, a state of affairs, right? Um, and if you think about that, um, it kind of makes sense that the that first the ism would do would integrate the first two elements, the the the, the, the two dominant elements of, of our day and age, so to speak modernism and postmodernism um, but to fully manifest it really needs to go back farther into deeper layers of the psyche I suppose and collective psyche and it also um, and, and and farther back in history and then it would integrate integrate um, uh, traditionalism and uh, and the indigenous uh, uh, inside as well. So that's, however, it should be pointed out that uh, that's what, what integralism in many ways was already trying to do. Uh, and many ways why I opted for what I saw as a more conservative integralism. Let's at least try and get this part right. <laughs> because what inter when integralism did try to integrate uh, tradition or traditional religion, it did you know, go magical and so forth, right? Uh, which did lead to its collapse. Uh, so, uh, so I do view it as um, as a maturation towards that attractor point, um, and I would want to call that attractor point modernity. Uh, I, I suppose I'm just from this experience of the with integralism and so forth. I just want to be. A, a little bit con conservative about it. And that's why I for now use the term metamodernism for particularly modernity and postmodernity. Mm. All right. right. Thank you. Is that Daniel, thank you very much. And um I mean again as I as I sort of tried to summarize uh with Greg and Lena, what came through for me there was your sense of um well first of all helpfully grounding it in the personal which I always find useful yeah. when you're speaking of theory like where did this come from? Certain challenges in life, anxieties, trying to make sense of the world, noticing that you were caught up in systems and structures. Uh, you're disappearing visually, Daniel, there we go. Um, noticing that that was the case and then reaching for theory to make sense of it, uh, find, coming upon integral theory and feeling that it was somehow lacking, that it, it, as you put it, lapsed into magical thinking and simultaneously observe this uh, new kid on the block of some kind, metamodernism, noticing the ethos, the vibe, noticing a somewhat more um, mature, arguably, uh, perspective. And you thought, I can make sense of that and make use of it vis-a-vis -vis the other work that I want to do uh, politically. And um, that's what led to the listening society and so forth. Um, so that's kind of laying it out. I'm I'm feeling um, curious, you know, I, I'm sort of going to imagine what David would say here rather than ask him, even though he is there. Um, but I, I'm not sure we've really convinced people that it matters yet. Like I want to use the remaining time um, just to 
kind of hammer that home because we've 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 described it. I've just you know I've summarized. You've all tried. We all tried our best to make sense of why it matters. But I'm wondering if the audience feels it. Um, if you know, do you need if you, if you know if metamodernism is the answer? What is the question? Would be one way of looking at it. Or if I don't have metamodernism, what do I lack? Would be another. Can any of you try and speak to that? Yeah, then. I, I would, I would, I mean, we are in a time where things are, a lot of things are up in the air. Uh, we've had a, a financial crash in 2008. Uh, we have technologies that are wreaking havoc on, on job markets. We have a war now in Ukraine. Um, and, and so there are structures that are breaking up. Um, mm -hmm. And we're brought together with people from around the globe uh, online. Right. And so we are confronted with very different viewpoints. And there's also more, more migration than we've ever had before. So the, the natural, and I would call that a natural inclination to uh, identify with an in-group and think that there is one truth in the world um, is constantly challenged. Right. And we need to deal with that. And, and postmodernism has tried that for, I guess, one or two generations. And we create anxiety because if you can't connect honestly deeply emotionally to and with other people and cultural heritage and language and symbolic worlds and i can refer back to eric from who talked about the escape from freedom and he said that moral aloneness is when you are uh, you can be around other people, but you're not sharing a symbolic world, which is way worse than being physically alone and feeling that you have all these people out there that you're actually emotionally and morally connected with. Mm. And so if we have a civilization where whenever you say, oh, I like this, and somebody says, yeah, but you could also not like it, or somebody else likes something better in a different way, if you have your honest emotions deconstructed all the time, uh, you end up uh, with a, I mean, then you'll never even be able to feel yourself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've reached a point where I think a lot of people, particularly young people who grew up with this, um, have suffered and do suffer. And, and, um, and they have a really hard time finding communities where people actually care about them. And they have a hard time connecting with people. They have a hard time finding friends. They have a hard time finding commitment and love they have a hard time right i mean but, look, but at, look at tinder i mean the sex right. has become a commodity i mean it's like you just you know right, right, right. But, switch, but, switch I mean, people one way or the other and but, so the deep connection the intimacy is something that we we've almost lost the words for the language for it and so we need to reconnect with that Right. And we can't do that with postmodernism, and we can't skip postmodernism either, because then we lose an analytical tool. Um, so we do need all of that, and we do need the religious heritage and to go into, I mean, that's why sports play such a huge role. Right. And if we don't have animism and if we don't have that contact to nature, then we got conspiracy theories. Okay, because then, we need that idea of, oh, something is behind it and, and is in charge of everything, and, and they are doing it. And that used to be the spirits in nature. Now it's, I don't know, Hillary Clinton and some alien uh, reptiles in a pizza joint. So okay, I mean, yeah. where, where we don't give our minds this heritage and meaningful connection, yeah. it's gonna go out and create it and right. make it on its own. I mean, all of that it sounds like it makes sense. The, the challenge though I still feel is, and I, I've noticed this from some of the questions from the audience. And um, I don't think people doubt, or at least few do that the world is, struggling in certain ways and that we're struggling to make sense of it because we seem to there seem to be a, a mismatch between the conceptual resources available and the world as we experience it what it, what remains to be proven is that metamodernism helps us to do that now you've tried to say that postmodernism doesn't do it and we need something else and you've also explained why metamodernism is that thing and all of us in our, in our own ways try to do that what i suppose i'm looking for in this last bit before we take the other questions is you know concepts at all you know like the whole notion that someone like i don't know who isn't philosophically inclined doesn't get high on conceptual distinctions um why would they feel the need for this like can they not go about their business without it greg um i agree with 
yeah, I agree with uh, Lena's depiction of the problem that we face, of course, um, and Daniel's as well. I think where I differ and where the kind of community of um, scholars and arts critics or whatever that I'm kind of affiliated with is um, we don't see metamodernism as much of an aspirational thing that we're working towards as we see it as something that's actually already happening um, in society, whether people have the word for it or not. Um, and it's easiest, of course, to, um, you know, to locate it and, and, and talk about it when you're talking about things in the arts, because you have specific cultural products and you can analyze them and interpret them and, and stuff. But it's also present in um, the style of humor that regular everyday people use when they're communicating with each other and even just kind of in our slang terms and in, you know, in, in all kind of, and it shows up in the ways that people um, appreciate and get behind the polit political leaders that they, they like. Um, and so on the one hand, I think metamodernism is already doing that job, you know, to an extent of giving us a room and a space, you know, a safe space for meaningfulness and a dignity about our interiority. Um, why? So on that level, it's already doing a job. And then the value in having a word for it and having discussions about it among the kind of people who think that way, not everybody, you know, the majority of humans don't care about the word postmodernism or modernism either. They just live their lives. But among those of us who kind of do tell stories about the stories, um, to have the name metamodernism is kind of like a flag that helps us recognize that this motion is taking place, that there's a need for it, that there might be a need for more of it. Um, and, you know, you mentioned um, Jason Josephson Storm, who put out a book called Metamodernism, and he's bringing this approach to the way that um, scholars and theorists do their work. So he's suggesting a correction for the excesses of the kind of postmodern academic style that does often leave everybody in the dust um, and suggesting a way that that can be done that is more humane and human um, and things like that. Um, so I guess it, the, the short answer is um, metamodernism is a solution that's already happening and by naming it and seeing it and understanding it, we can have it happen more. Okay, got it. So listen, there are some questions on the list. Lena, just give me a second. You both want to speak. Okay, well, that's good. Um, let's speak then. You go, you, you go first, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to reply as well to, to uh, the whole uh, why metamodern is question. For, right. First of all, dodge or avoid the question. It's, I mean, um, it, it's, yeah, well, it's this sort of a trap question, if you think about it. Like, uh, sort of a what, sorry, sort of a? Sort of a trap question. If you think right. About it. It, it turns to have, like, how would you want to sell? Like, aha, uh -huh, so then, then you automatically get, go into car, car salesman's mode or, or whatever, and, and the person uh, on the other side, then by reverse psychology, automatically doesn't want <laughs> doesn't want to buy what you're saying because hey i'm being talked into something right uh, so uh, so numero uno is metamodernism doesn't have to talk anything anyone into anything right it's it's a tool first of all it's just a word right so and then, then people attach five or six different meanings to it and uh, those have been mapped out um it, it it's a topic it's a discipline uh, so, um, uh, if you study a topic or a discipline, there will be different fruits in your life, um, depending on which take you have on it. Um, I can tell from my perspective, it's a cheat code, basically. Uh, you, you walk around in society, you, uh, you can basically see around corners. That, that's what it does, right? If, if you actually study it hard and you see well, see, wow, there's a cultural logic to this. There, there are patterns that people aren't seeing it opens doors you can, you can, code. okay etc etc et and then that is fun to play with 
So then you go into playful struggle. This is one like we we like these oscillations, right? So sincere irony, new sincerity, or um, or um, uh, let, let's say pragmatic romanticism. Or, um, playful struggle is a good one. Uh, that okay, the better analytical tools you have to see how the world works, the better you see. Well, this is going to more likely going to go that way than this way. And then the best bet for us together is probably this way. Mm. For, for instance, uh, many years ago, you wrote, Jonathan, before you knew the term metamodernism, but you were a metamodernly minded person. You wrote a, wrote a pamphlet called Spiritualized, and it was about inner development. You, you wrote about a similar stuff, Lena. What happens today? inner development goals is exploding uh, from, from networks that of people you at that point didn't even know. Uh, and uh, it's taking over, this idea is taking over as a complement to, uh, to a sustainable development goals. Uh, the, the whole administration, the whole public sector of Costa Rica, we had a huge, huge conference in Stockholm and where, where they have the um, Nobel Prize uh, ceremony, etc. It's happening now. And you saw it before it was cool. <laughs> and you invested in these ideas and you were part indirectly, if anything else, of making that happen. That's the whole point of having good social theory mm -hmm. that you can do stuff with it. And doing stuff is fun and meaningful. I think that's a good enough reason. And then like, Beyond that, I don't want to. I don't want to talk anybody in, like into into buying the particular term or something. Like I want enough friends who are on the same page or wavelength so that we can do cool stuff together. That's all. Okay, got it. Lena, thank you, Lena. Yeah. Um, I and mean, well, I, I Lena, describe... very briefly, so we get one time for a question. So, like two minutes. Yeah, so yeah. I. But I, I would like to say one thing, because I mean, we got three versions of metamodernism, metamodernity here, and I think it's it's a great thing that we have several, I mean, this is an ecosystem of people struggling with making sense of the time that we're in, and where we could, where we might want to go. And I don't, I don't want us to agree. I actually like that we that we have three different ways of looking at this, and there are more people out there, and that we're exploring this from different angles, and we're looking at different things. So if you look at the arts and what's going on right now, you see one thing. If you see there is this these structures that are changing, and we need to make sure that eight billion people have food and safety, then you look at something else, and so uh, and that's good. That's the both end, but it's good. So, uh, so I, I, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to, you know, say who's right or which is the right version of, of metamodernism or metamodernity. But I do want us to be specific in what way we're using the word when we're using it, um, because that if we don't, it's going to be a mess. And I was actually there was a, a Finnish university that held a pre-conference uh, event about. Uh, our organization Nordic Bildung and uh, associated us with tons, of, with tons of stuff we do not do because they apparently had found something that linked to something on the internet. It was very uncomfortable. So uh, we, we, should, uh, we should be very specific in, in what ways we're using these words. But apart from that, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's great that we disagree. Okay, great. And I, I, I'm glad we have a little time to take a question from the audience. Sorry to be brisk there. Um, just to say that that feeling of coming to know it was some of the happiest intellectual time of my life the, the, that three months of like okay I bet, again I've been talking about metamodernism for months now people keep calling me it uh, the word is kind of on this you know in a month or network I suppose I'd better invest some time figuring out what it means and it was really rewarding uh, but it did take time you know there's a lot to read a lot to think a lot to question and then to find one's own position and then to write it um, but really rewarding by the end of it I felt like something good had happened so um anyway i want to uh and i hear you clay Gil, uh kilgore kilgore i guess that this is really rich and we should go over but that's david's call and um, but i can take one question and i think the question we should take is from 
Let me see here. We'll go back to the list and see where, who's still top of the pops. Uh, oops, sorry, that's gone. Is that right? David, maybe you could help me. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So actually, Greg, you've been asked to say again, which is interesting, top of the pops is a question to ask Greg to reiterate this line you had about the nature of metamodernity or metamodernism being about protecting the interiority from the degradation of postmodernism. That line, can you find that to reiterate it? It seems to be something that more than one person wants to, to hear. Um, sure. Um, so, first of all, I don't think postmodernism was or is a mistake. As kind of everybody has mentioned, it's an important um, intellectual and even emotional, uh, you know, structure and, and tool. But the um, whole purpose of postmodernism is to take attention away from the center, whether the center is the mainstream, whether the center is like the dominant white male patriarchy, whether and whether the center is the self. Postmodernism uh, challenges the very idea of the subject and, and the self. Um, and that was an important thing to do. But when that's all you're doing, and when it's kind of made to be sort of like you're considered either uncool or kind of not very bright, or whatever to take the self seriously and to take feelings seriously and to take um, you know earnest appreciation of beauty uh, seriously when 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 none of that stuff is permitted the, the, none of us are really participating in life because what we are is selves um, and so that's the degradation that postmodern can can cause as a side effect of the good stuff that it does. And so, you know, and to me, metamodernism is motivated to be a course correction for that bad side effect um, that postmodernism engenders. And uh, without going on too long, um, what the metamodern art, artistic and cultural products tend to do is um, incorporate the postmodern games and playfulness as kind of like a spoonful of sugar to help the serious earnestness go down um, without people having to feel embarrassed about it or feel naive about it. And, and, you know, if I had the chance to talk for hours, I could give you example after example of, after example in all different areas of culture where you can see people coming up with this approach themselves, but you just have to, I guess, look and see if you can find it yourself. Thank you. Listen, the, I actually got that wrong, that last question, but it's, I'm really glad we've got that mm. iteration. And um, David, if you permit me a couple more minutes, there was actually a question from Brandon. Um, would we, be, and this is a good one for all of us actually, would we, and, we, and we're gonna, I'm gonna give it one minute each roughly, and we're gonna end, okay. Um, would we benefit by metamodernizing, another version of that term, metamodernizing some of our institutions, public, private, and civil society? If so, how might we begin to do this? Now, I'm quite sure Daniel has an answer for that uh, and a whole book that answers it really. Um, but quickly, Lena and Rachel, and then give Daniel a chance at the end. Okay, so, I mean, let's take a municipality. I would go with the group sizes. And so whenever you have, say, a, a city of, I don't know, 3 million people, um, its relationships to other cities, towns, uh, group sizes of 3 million people could be postmodern. I mean, that's where we need to take multiple perspectives. Inside the municipality, we can use the modern world and the rule of law and, and democracy. Once we get down to individual companies or departments or offices or like a thousand people, that's where we can ritualize uh, interactions and have a rich symbolic world. And we have a, a, a hierarchy of sorts. And then when we go back down to the group size of maybe 10 people or, and so forth, we should not keep track of everything because we need to regulate uh, our interactions person to person. And so you can take a, a, a what do you call it, a home nurse taking care of, of uh, old people in their own home. I mean, 
you shouldn't register everything and have everything you know registered you should actually trust people and and leave it to the the, the home nurses to uh, to figure out what kind of service are we going to provide to mrs jones and what are we going to provide to mr smith and how are we going to you know let them figure it out themselves and 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 negotiate it and see what what happens so so we could structure uh, according to group sizes and uh, and governance, I guess you would call it. That would be one way of doing okay. it. Okay, thank you. And um, Greg, I'm curious if the question makes sense to you. You know, does it? You might say it's already there. Uh, you don't have to meta modernize. That doesn't actually um, make sense. Or how would you see it? I think that it's already there in the arts and in informal cultural products. It's not all that much very there in institutions, and. Um, I will say that I am a little more cautious than probably the others on this panel are about um, like really trying to intentionally implement that because we're talking about um, people's state of mind. And so it starts to scarily sound to me like we're talking about engineering um, people's state of mind. And, and I want to kind of leave that a little bit more up to chance and people's true nature so i'm more comfortable in this kind of happening on a more informal level but um, i have seen institutions use the meta modern style in their marketing and in their self presentation and things like that and that is exciting to me great 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 so daniel um yeah. i think you're all about meta modernizing society in a sense so tell me I mean, in a sense, I, in a sense, uh, at the same time, too big question, uh, too brief answer. So, I mean, uh, generally speaking, let's not fall into the trap, the socialist trap, so to speak, that, well, like Soviet Union, we're now a socialist country. Everything is socialist. We're socialist art. It's next level. It's blah, 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 socialist this, socialist that. And before, and within two or three or four years, people were already losing faith and it wasn't fun anymore. And people were, you know, art, artists were hating themselves for selling out to, to power and et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, so, so, and of course, when, when everything push came to shove, it wasn't actually better, it was actually worse. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the question so, was, what, what, what would it mean? Like, what would it actually look like, I suppose? And well, yeah, I you so, have given so, some thought to that. So metamodernizing, the, the only answer I can give in, in a good enough time would be there's greater focus on inner dimensions. And uh, the, the, the logic, social logic pertaining to metamodernism uh, would somehow be reflected or manifested in the relationships between human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, however, how do we begin? I actually agree very much with you, Greg. Uh, we uh, do begin uh, by the arts, through by and through the arts, uh, actually applying for EU money as today, uh, right until I got into this call uh, for for uh, events in that in that realm. Given that the arts are intuitive, they come first, they're free, they're safer, uh, safe space in many ways. Institutions are the most dangerous and they come last in this, like first arts and then philosophy, and then I suppose sciences, et cetera, right? So, uh, so uh, I, I do have a, a very small kid and uh, she didn't sleep her for, very well during her first couple of uh, months. So I was up all night and you know what I did? I watched, Bojack Horseman, all six, um, all six seasons to, uh, to just could, to get to know what the fuzz was about, and I could definitely see it. Right, uh, there is something about pop, the first season. I thought, well, this is just a remake of The Simpsons. No, it wasn't. They got me. Right, <laughs> they really got me. Like I, I started caring about what happened to this tragic, pathetic horse character. And then there was lots of hope and beauty in the tragedy and nastiness and futility of the story. Well, I mean, and, and I really feel it resonates, right? There, there really is some kind of structure. If something like that can make it that big, I think on some level, we are engineering minds. Uh, and it is, as you say, uh, Greg, happening fairly spontaneously. We're just helping spontaneity out 
there <laughs> with, a bit, with a bit of analysis, with a bit of uh, pointing in directions. Also, when I point like in, in prophetic or, uh, you know, um, directions like, oh, societies should develop like this and that, it is also in this spirit of playful um, struggle or, or fact meeting fiction. It's not, uh, it's not, mm, well, it's not Marxist dialectic materialism or something like that, right? Uh, so, so, so in, in that way, I, I believe such things stimulate one another, right? Those, those futures that we imagine, which we know are fictional, but we think are important nonetheless. And because we're trying to move past post-modernity or post-modernism, we, we allow ourselves such dreams. That's, that would be my, uh, my end note. Okay. Wow, great. And um, we've made it through the end, I believe. And uh, much more to say, like overall, just um, just starting. Did Lena disappear? It looks like she did. Um, we're just, uh, you know, there's so much more to say. And um, I would encourage those of you who are interested, who are still watching, um, to look at some of the written materials that are mentioned earlier in the discussion. If you don't know how to save the chat, there are three dots on the right-hand side of the chat near the bottom. Click on that and press save this discussion and you'll have all the links. You won't have to scramble to photograph them or anything. Um, yeah, all of us here have written more about this. L look into that, but equally go and watch uh, Metamodern Artifacts and see where it takes you uh, spiritually and politically. Um, so it just remains for me to thank David and Rebel Wisdom for making this session possible to thank Lena Rachel Anderson for joining us, to thank Greg Denver for joining us, thank Daniel Gortz for joining us. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, we all believe it's worthwhile. It's, it's a concept and one can only expect so much from that, but it's a concept that can help you perceive context, can help you feel differently, think differently, maybe helps create new cultural codes, um, maybe helps point the way politically but certainly, if you sit with it and try to make sense of what it means for you, I'm confident that it will be good for you um, and lead to broadly good things. So uh, with that thought, I will leave you.